Hey everybody, welcome back. This week's video is the third part of a four-part series on discovery or the disclosure process. My hope is to help you move through this phase as quickly and as smoothly as, as you can, as smoothly as possible. I know that it will take time and hard work, but hopefully with just a few months, not years, and with some dedication to the process, you won't create further damage. My encouragement is to be forthcoming, to be patient and respectful of each other and the process and the situation that you find yourself in. You know, without establishing some proper boundaries and guidelines, raging emotions will hijack this process and delay your healing, both individually and of the marriage. The suggestions that I'm covering today are not written in stone, and every situation is somewhat different. I do hope to at least help you create a safe container for yourself and each other and for the process. Please remember the goal of discovery, and better yet disclosure, is to make things better, ultimately, not worse. I also want to remind you that you will need other shared experiences beyond dealing with the infidelity. You cannot deal with the negative aspects of infidelity all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But you also can't stuff them and avoid addressing the situation without those feelings later reappearing even stronger as anger or verbal or physical attacks, criticism, jabs, disengagement, depression, and the list goes on and on and on. To make the process productive and safe, both parties need to make a commitment to the discovery process after the affair and commit to be safe for yourself and for each other. Number one, I want you to remember, maintain healthy boundaries. Agree to no verbal or physical abuse. Agree not to talk about this after 8 p.m. if possible. Your ability to control emotions will be limited if you're tired, and then you won't sleep well. Make the goal to have a rational conversation versus an emotional one. Don't talk around your children. Both of you need to agree to keep the children out of the marital issues. I can't say that strongly enough. Second, agree on whom each of you can speak with about your situation. You're going to need support. Try to agree to two or three safe people and that are safe for the marriage where each of you can speak with about the struggles you're having. And third, deal with questions as they arise. Attempting to deal with questions at a predetermined time, like once a week on a Wednesday night, that won't really help. Though I am in favor of a daily check-in, Putting it off too long can be counterproductive. If the injured spouse has to wait too long to ask questions, the frustration of waiting just builds and builds, which in May, in turn, cause the unfaithful spouse to be defensive. And dealing with questions as they arise when it's appropriate helps the discovery process be less emotional. Another thing is continually texting your mate or calling them while they're at work is so counterproductive, especially if they have a job where it's not safe to talk or they waste a lot of work time. Don't make any major decisions until you've had time to process through all the information and all the losses and had some time to calm down. So those are just some general guidelines. I'm going to talk about some specific ones now for the injured spouse and for the unfaithful spouse. And again, these are all suggestions. Every situation is a little bit different. So it's not written in stone, but hopefully it will give you both some things to think about and talk about as you navigate through this process. So here's some guidelines for the injured spouse. There are no deal breakers. Commit to the process. Agree not to make any decisions about the marriage until you've gone through this process of discovery or disclosure. Don't punish by threatening divorce or threatening to have your own affair each time they tell you something you don't like. It is difficult for the unfaithful spouse 
to answer questions if when they do, they are attacked or verbally or even physically abused. By all means, share your pain, but not in a destructive way or a destructive pattern. You just continue to traumatize each other. If you're an injured spouse and you want information, you need to make sure it's safe for your mate to share the answers. Also, encourage your mate's disclosure. Try not to react. Certainly respond in your pain or whatever you're feeling. If you can't be safe enough to receive the information, then they're not going to feel safe enough to give you that information. Please don't further punish them for being honest. If you've been guilty of rage or shaming or hurling jabs in the past, I'd encourage you to acknowledge your mistake and make amends and then move forward. Commit to yourself to try to be better and to do it better going forward. Please hear me, I'm not condoning what they've done, but without honesty, there's no way to deal with the deception. Their willingness to be honest and transparent indicates their move towards connection and intimacy, loyalty, and commitment. Keep reminding yourself that regardless of how devastating the information, the fact that they are answering your questions is a positive in that it indicates change and a hope of a better future. And please no marathon sessions. Most questions, I believe, can be answered in about 10 minutes. If it goes on longer than that, you've started lecturing or rapid fire questionings and they are going to avoid or blame or storytell. Let them answer the question and then move on. It helps the unfaithful spouse to be more open to the process. And there's, you'll find that there's less resistance. Try to stay rational. I know it's hard, especially in the beginning. Emotions can escalate out of control and they'll stop the conversation. The objective again is to have a rational conversation. If either party gets overly emotional, the conversation will be hurtful rather than helpful. And both of you need permission to request a timeout when it's apparent that the conversation will only make things worse. And I want to say a little bit about the use of timeouts. Both agree to the language we need in order to take a break. Agree to the signals of non-helpful fighting. You know, John Gottman's research would say that starting a conversation with an attack or blame is not helpful. He calls that a harsh startup. And it will go from bad to worse in about 90 seconds. Also look for the four horsemen that he, he has researched. Criticism, defensiveness, contempt, and stonewalling. Those are not helpful. What I have seen over the years is if, if you can manage those and, and be aware of those in yourself, not in your spouse, that can change the whole dynamic of your relationship pretty quickly as you agree I am not going to have a critical conversation or I'm not going to be defensive. I'm not going to stonewall. There's tons of research around that on the website and on the internet. If you go to Gottman's website, there'll be a lot of information about those four things. The other thing he talks a lot about is emotional flooding. And that's where your heart rate rises to more than 100 beats per minute. You can have an emotional conversation. We can be hurt or sad or angry. And our heart rate doesn't get that high. It, it may elevate a little bit, but once it reaches that 100 beats, then all this blood chemistry begins to change. And it is really hard, if not impossible, to have a rational conversation. So for some people, if, if you have a pattern of that, I would encourage you both to wear a heart rate monitor. And if it starts to beep at 100 beats per minute, then you probably ought to take a break. Again, I want to say you can have an emotions. It just doesn't go over the top. Heart rate is going to be the thing that determines that. The other thing is that the person calling the timeout has to say when they'd like to resume the conversation. I say that it's got to be within 30 minutes to 24 hours, no longer than that. And when you do take a break, don't focus on the argument during this timeout. Instead, do something that's relaxing or soothing so that when you do come back, 
you first seek to understand your spouse's perspective before trying to be understood. Also, allow yourself to take breaks from discovery. If you need a break and want to go out and have a nice dinner or a good time, tell your spouse that they can take you out, but that nothing has changed. And it's just that you need the night off from this. Tell them that tomorrow you'll probably go back to where you were the night before. You just need some time away from this. And make sure you're getting the information that you need. Ask yourself two questions. Why do I need to know this? And will the answer to this question help me move forward in my own healing? If the answer to either, either of those two questions is no, then as difficult as it may seem, you might want to consider not asking that question. The other thing is limit the why questions. Your mate will not know right off the bat. And generally the thought, no further than, I thought I'd never get caught. Don't spend too much time trying to figure out in the discovery stage. There is time for that, but it's going to be months before they understand the why. And don't ask comparison questions either. They'll only create more intrusive thoughts for you. Also, try to hold yourself accountable to the 24-hour rule. If a question comes up where your spouse is concerned that the answer would cause more intrusive thoughts, such as, you know, sexual positions or acts or any kind of comparison, then allow them to use the 24-hour rule. They'll agree to give you the answer in 24 hours, but during that time, think about it, pray about it, meditate, make sure it's an answer you really, truly want. This step is key to gaining ground in understanding both spouses' recovery. So I'm going to switch gears and talk about guidelines for the unfaithful spouse. First, agree to answer your mate's questions. Tell the whole truth and be transparent. Much of the time, more damage is done by the deception than by the sexual acts themselves. It's the deception that creates the sense of betrayal. Not only can they not trust you, but then they can't trust the reality or their intuition. They don't even know if they can trust their gut about what seems real. Please, please answer their questions. It's the only way to help them find out what's real. And third, you've got to cut off all contact with your affair partner if you haven't already. Also, when asked the question and you don't know, then say so. Also, let them know you will do whatever is necessary to find out. Also, listen to what your mate has to say, whatever observations they have. If it's true, feel it. Own it and then let it pass. If you're not sure you don't know, then maybe ask other people to see what their observations are about you or about your behavior. The idea here is to learn how to, to be in relationship better. First, relationship with ourself and then with others. Also, take note of what makes your spouse anxious and do what you can do to minimize those situations. And usually that's about reminders. Put proper boundaries in your life as proof that you're doing what's necessary to not only protect your spouse, but also to protect yourself and the relationship. And please, please, please don't be defensive. Rather take full responsibility. Don't blame your mate. Remember, bad marriages don't cause affairs. If they did, two people in a bad marriage, but usually only one person has an affair. That shows that a bad marriage is not the cause. Bad marriages don't cause affairs. Really bad choices do. So take responsibility for what you've done, for the choices that you've made. Be patient with the process. Discovery and surviving infidelity takes time and may include times of irrationality. This process can take up to two years. Don't expect your mate to just get over it. Be rigorously honest. That's the type of honesty where you share the parts of you that you don't want to share. If you minimize it, your mate won't believe you. If you tell it honestly, at least your mate will know that you're trying to be honest with her or him and yourself. 
and let your mate decide how much information he or she needs. You really don't know what they need to know. Ask them what level of detail they'd like to, to receive and then answer their questions. Please don't try to control the flow of information to your spouse. And if they begin asking comparison questions, remember to talk about the 24-hour rule. Tell them you'll give them the information, but just ask them to think, to pray, to meditate about whether they really want that information or not. And if they do, you, you got to give it to them. And, and you can't enforce that 24-hour rule, but encourage them to use it. And give your spouse permission to talk to others that are safe for them and for the marriage. And please don't make this process all about you. If you become self-consumed with guilt and shame about what you've done, then you won't be able to be present with them. And you're really making it all about you at that moment. And I'm sure every one of you would attest to the fact that the discovery process can be highly emotional. As you wade through the enormity of it all, it's difficult to understand what's happening to us. But following the, the steps and the guidelines that I've talked about, it will really help the process and create safety for both of you. Remember, you got to take your time and go slow. I believe so strongly in the process of reaching a full disclosure that our EMS weekend can really be a helpful tool in creating that opportunity to come clean with new or even more information if it's out there and in a safe and supportive for both of you environment. If you need help with disclosure, forgiveness, or finding hope for a better future, I hope you'll give it some thought and consider joining us at an EMS weekend soon. Thanks so much for joining me again this week. I'll be back again next week to finish up this series that we've been talking about discovery and or disclosure. Know that we at Affair Recovery are hoping and praying for all of you for a great outcome, especially during this trying time on our planet. Thanks so much for joining me. I'll see you next week.